Okay, we left last time with some unfun unfunished, yeah, unfinished business. And I want to take a look at that and talk a bit about that. So let me download the example from last week and we'll go from there to address that. I was 50-50. I was able to identify why one thing wasn't working the way I expected, but I was not able to identify why the other one was. And, I don't know. Fortunately, we have a workaround for it, so I don't have to worry. All right. To refresh your memory about what went wrong, It related to the drop down and a grid view that were linked. And we wanted to do two things. First of all, I wondered how come the technology ones didn't show up initially. That's one I didn't figure out. The second one was how to add a dummy value. And that one I did figure out. So. Open website, polls app, polls app. And that was, if I remember correctly, category list. on selected index change. I probably double clicked it, it created that event, I deleted the event, but it was still associated with that control. Alright, let me show you what I mean. So if I run this guy here, will be the first one on the list, but it will not show the grid items for technology. Alright, nothing in the grid. Now if I go and show something else and come back to technology, it does show the three items. And I'm not really sure why that's happening. I tried some things and I didn't get it to work. We'll, we'll have to keep our eye on this problem as the semester goes on. Maybe some insight will pop into my head. A workaround for it is to add a dummy value at the beginning. All right. And there was a question that actually I sort of took in a different direction. So I will answer uh, the different direction first and I'll go back to the original question. All right. And the question is, is how to add a dummy value to this. Well, if we look at our control here, on the drop down list, for any of these controls, we can associate a number of different events. All right? And these events are, are events that we can write code for. And we've already seen some of them by like double clicking on the object. That takes us to like the most common event. Like so if we double click on a button, it takes us to the button clicked event, right? Because that's typically what you want to do with a button, is click it and have something happen. With a drop down, if we double click it, it takes us to the selected item change event. Because usually that's the most important event. You know, what is there something we want to do when the, the value of the drop down changes? In this case, we don't want either of those. Alright, we don't have a button and we don't want a selective item. Uh, what we want to do is we want to add a dummy value after it has bound the value from the database. After 
it has bound the data source to the control. So, the events start with the word on. And you'll notice with this, and, and pay attention because this goes beyond this particular problem into other things that we're going to be looking at, possibly later today or possibly Thursday or possibly next week. I guess it depends on how things go. But notice there's an on data binding and on data bound. All right. You're gonna see, we're going to see a lot of cases where there is two versions of the event, one that's sort of written in the present tense, the name of it, one is represented, uh, is written in the past tense. And this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't just, you know, uh, an exercise in grammar, it really means something different. In one case, the one event happens before that particular event happens. The other event happens after the particular event. So, in this case, we have our SQL data source that is bound to our dropdown. The on data binding event would happen before the data source is bound to the dropdown. So that's the present tense version of the event. So that's a before. You know, while it's in the process of doing it, but before it's actually completed. All right. The data bound is the past tense, which means that this event fires after the data source and the dropdown have been bound together, have been linked together. That's the one we want. All right. Because this will allow us to write some code to insert a new line into the dropdown. All right. So I'm going to pick on data bound equals and we have a choice there and we're going to take the choice of create a new event because we don't have any any events in our code behind. This is going to create a function in our code behind. So I'll click create new event. And if I go then and look at the drop down, or the, the code behind for it, there we see the shell of the event. Alright. And if we notice on data bound equals drop down list one data bound. That's the name of the method it creates. So now we have a chunk of code that, that is going to fire off after this guy hooks to the database class, or database object, rather. So here we can write some code to do some things. All right. For an event to really fire off after, or for a function to fire off after something specific has happened, we have to have it in two places. It has to be associated with the method in the ASPX file, and there has to be a corresponding method in the .cs file. So here we have our method in the CS file. If we look at the ASPX file, we've associated this method with the on data bound event. So everything should be okay. Now. I can create a list item. Drop down lists are a list of list items, consists of a bunch of list items. So I can create a new one. Can anyone tell me what this instruction right here does? List item li equals new list item. Um, you're most of the way right. It creates a new list item object, but it hasn't put it in the drop down yet. We need to we need to say what we want to do with that list item here. List item li is the first part of the sentence or the statement. This is simply saying I have a variable called li and it's going to be of type list item. 
So that's what list item li means. That does not create an object. All right. What creates an object is this, new list item. In fact, we could actually write this as two separate statements. What we had initially is sort of shorthand for these two statements together. List item li says, hey, I have a variable called li, and it's going to point to a list item. After that line runs, there isn't a list item created yet, though. We've just sort of warned the compiler, hey, that at some point our variable li is meant to be used to point to a list item. The next line is what actually creates the object. It creates an instance of a list item. Again, list item is a class. It's representative of all, you know, so it's a, the template for all list items ever. And we're going to make one. Now, the empty parentheses specifies that when we create this list item, we are not going to initialize any of the variables. Every class has at least one, but can have multiple constructors. Constructors are like methods. They're similar to methods. And their job is to make an instance of this class. li equals new list item simply says, hey, I'm going to make a list item, and I'm not going to set any parameters. But there can be alternate constructors that have multiple arguments. For example, in this case, it's telling us that there's actually four constructors we can use. The first one accepts no argument, so we won't initialize any fields. The second one is we can create a list item with a text string. What it will do then is we'll use a text string for the text property of the list item and the value. Remember, what does a list item contain? It contains a text item, that is what the user sees, and it contains a value, that is what's behind the scenes that the script sees. So I could go in and put list item and put a string, and that, that string will be used for both the text and the value. The third option is I can explicitly set a different text and string value. So I could say the text is choose category. The string value could be an empty string. And then finally, we have our fourth constructor where we could create a list item but disable it because maybe later on we want to enable it for some reason. I'm actually going to pick constructor number three. And the text I want it to be is choose category. And the value I want it to have is an empty string. Just nothing. All right. Now, this just creates a list item that's sort of floating in space. I could go and add this to any number of different dropdowns. I could do a lot of things with it. But what I want to do is I want to add it to this dropdown. So, <clears throat> I'm going to say dropdown list one dot insert. No, I don't want insert dot items dot insert and I can specify the list item or the index in other words where I want to put it I'm going to put it at the beginning so I'm going to pick zero and the list item object itself now if we notice here again with this there's two versions of the function that's called overloading a function. And it can be very powerful. It allows you to um, 
call a function and supply as many parameters as you have, provided you, you, you match one of the options that are provided to you. And then the rest of the values will sort of get filled in by default. So in this case, we have a function that accepts an integer and a list item. There's also one that consists of an integer for the position and a string. And what it will do is it will take that string, make a list item for it behind the scenes, and then insert it in there. When you overload a function, the number or types of the arguments have to be different. So in this case, version 1 has an integer and a list item as an argument. Function 2 has an integer and a string as an argument. If we look at the constructor uh, um, for list item, we'd notice that each one of them has a different set of arguments, different in terms of either the number of arguments or the data type of the arguments. That's simply because you couldn't have two functions with the exact same arguments. Otherwise, if you tried to call that function with those arguments, which one would it use? So there can only be one function with a given set of arguments. So I'm going to say insert 0 li and I am back in business. And, yeah, go ahead. What's the difference between an insert and an add? Ah, good question. There's two methods, an insert and an add. Let's look at the arguments and see if we can figure out. And being that it's a dummy value, why wouldn't you put it as a negative one? You could put it as a negative one. That, that, that's just my choice. Um, I want to do add. If we look, add... All right, I can add a list item, or I can add a string. Notice what argument is missing. The position argument is missing. An add adds it to the end of the list. So if it were, uh, if there were three items in a drop down, it would put it in the fourth position. All right. The insert allows us to put it in the position that we want to. So since I want this to be the top one on the list. I'll, I'll put it on the, the top one on the list. All right. The value doesn't really matter. It's arbitrary. You could make that negative one if you're comfortable with it. That comes into play later on when we do a validation. If we were to do a required field validator on this, we'd have to make sure that we put our dummy value as negative one then. So it would know that negative one represents not a legit value. All right. Now, I'll go and run this, and we should have our drop-down list. With choose category on the top. And now my little problem goes away, because I'm always selecting it. Now, the question that was asked originally was how to make that dummy one choose everything. All right? And you could do it by playing with the SQL statement, or you could write some script to manipulate the SQL statement to say if there's no argument, if there's, if there's nothing in the dropdown, exclude the where clause. You could just have it without a where clause. It would probably be the best, most straightforward way to do it. All right? Now, the question I would ask from a usability perspective, though, is um, be careful if you took that methodology where the first one showed everything, you better be sure that there's not like tons of data. Otherwise, the search would go on forever. So like in a case like this, you figure, I don't know how many polls would expect to have, but 
if we had maybe, you know, 20 polls or so that are categorized, yeah, okay, you know, it'll select all, show those 20. But if we were talking about something like a, a course selection at LC, where there's hundreds and hundreds of courses, you probably wouldn't want that to, to do a select all. So what I would suggest is, if I was doing this and I wanted to do that functionality, I would actually programmatically create the, the SQL statement to, um, to uh, exclude a WHERE clause if, if nothing was selected in the dropdown. We'll actually probably do something along that lines towards the end of class. Uh, not, not today's class, but towards the end of the course. Questions on this? The other thing that we talked about last time to review was the insert. And the insert was actually pretty easy to do. Set this guy to my start page. It was pretty easy to do because, face it, I cherry picked the absolutely easiest table humanly possible. <laughs> all right? I'd almost have to try to mess this one up, all right? Because all I have is a single field that I can change. It's not going to let me change the category ID because that is recognized as a primary key. And generally, you don't want to change primary keys. Um, but we have here, again, a details uh, or a grid view and a details view. And we could edit this. When we go into edit mode, notice the little thingy changes. And we can go and change the value. And cancel will take us back to where we were. Update will actually save it in the database. All right. We can also do the same thing on a details view. Again, I, did, I put there just for demonstration purposes. Typically, you wouldn't have both of them on the page. Um, the delete, again, just goes and zaps stuff out of there. It doesn't even ask you nicely if you want to do it. It just deletes it. All right. You cannot insert on a grid view. The, let, let me rephrase that. The default behavior prohibits a inserting on a grid view. You can't insert on a details view. So if I wanted to add a new category, I could go in and enter in a new category and hit insert and away we go. So this is pretty straightforward. Essentially what we have in these grid views and details views is they, they when you allow these things to insert, update, and delete, these things operate in different modes. There's a display mode, there is an edit mode, and there's an insert mode. Now, in the case of grid view, there's no <coughs> insert mode, so there's just a display mode and the edit mode. All right. Now, we did this by a combination of changing the data source and changing either the grid view or the details view. For the data source, we went in and we actually put in our update statement, our insert statement, and our delete statement. I believe so, but I went back and changed it. Remember, if you remember, there was an extra yeah, parameter in there. Right, right. So now it put me in this mode where I can see it. So, oh. yeah, I'm pretty sure. sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But again, notice what we have is we have question marks for the parameters for things that are replaced at runtime. We don't, however, get a chance to fill in those values. Those values get filled in based on, like, the names of the columns and so forth, all right? We'll actually see the parameter list. These, this, this goes in behind the scenes and creates a list of parameters. Now, um, what 
what I want to say here. It's important, and, and, and this would, again, to, to, to revisit a recurring theme, it's important to be able to read the code in addition to just navigating through the GUI of Visual Studio. Because, you know, what's a GUI's job? A GUI's job is to hide certain details from you. Right? In a nutshell, that's what a GUI does. All right? With Windows GUI, you don't need to know that the command to change a directory is CD. Right? You just double click on the folder and you've changed directories. So it hides that little detail for you. Well, that can either be good news or bad news, right? That's good news because I don't want to have to sit and memorize all those DOS commands and, and type through there, you know. The bad news is, is if it doesn't do it right, if I am depending on the GUI and I have no idea how to look at the code, then I'm sort of behind the eight ball. So, let's look at the source again. Notice that this is a SQL data source and it has an insert statement, a uh, an update statement, and a delete statement. associated with it. And for each of those statements it has some parameter objects. For example, to delete a category, what all do you need? You just need the category ID. So that's the question mark that gets filled in in the delete statement. Where is the delete statement? Right here. Question mark that gets filled in and there is a category ID from the data source. Insert parameters, what's the only thing we need to know when we insert? The category name, right? We don't need to know the category ID because it's an auto number field. And we're automatically going to generate that. And lastly, when we update, we need to know both the category name and the category ID. Notice that these things are typed as well. That's actually very useful because there's all kinds of little gotchas that you can have when you write a SQL statement. For example, if you have the name something like, you know, O'Reilly. All right, let's say you have someone's name is O'Reilly. Their name may be spelled O apostrophe R-I-L-E-Y. Well, Guess what? An apostrophe is the same thing as a single quote. A single quote in the middle of a SQL statement is going to make the database think that that's the end of the string. And it's not going to know what to do with the, with the Riley part of the SQL statement. So it's going to blow up. All right. There's rules about what you put around uh, different parameters. You know, you put quotes around strings, you put nothing around numbers, you put some other character around dates. Well, who wants to memorize all those things? And who wants to worry about all the special characters that could mess things up like the apostrophe? These parameter objects take care of that for you. All right? In fact, who knows what a SQL injection attack is? Okay, what's a SQL injection attack. I think it's where somebody um, they type something into your program and uh, like for the name or something but they type in code instead of the name. Yeah, you can actually try to trick your uh, uh, an application into trying to execute SQL by doing something like putting and again this is not this is not hacker 101 but remember we got a you know, what when they say to catch a thief, you got to think like a thief, right? So, if I put, if I had a name field, and I put in the name field this, Here's what could happen. It could do 